Morning. So, um, my name is Andrew Nelson, uh, senior consultant with Red Hat Corporation in the U.S. Um, so, here to talk today about you know, using Zabbix to assist you with your performance tuning and also kind of talk about some best practices uh, when you're doing your performance tuning based on some experiences I've had, you know, working with some of our customers. Um, so, uh, basically, we're going to, you know, uh, talk about uh, what it is, you know, uh, in terms of methodologies for doing your performance tuning, some best practices around there. Um, talk about some of the uh, the basis of performance tuning. Little's Law, if you guys remember from two years ago, I kind of started talking about this one too. Little's Law is uh, kind of the basis for a lot of your performance tuning that you're going to do. Um, then we'll kind of go into an example, uh, talk about a little bit, and, you know, see some, some data, you know, get to, you know, see some more Zabbix graphs. I mean, we are at a Zabbix conference. Uh, and then, you know, kind of see what we, uh, you know, discovered through everything. So who am I? Uh, as I mentioned before, my name is Andrew Nelson. I work for Red Hat in the United States. I'm a senior uh, platform consultant over there. So I basically spend a lot of my time uh, installing Red Hat software in, in some of uh, customers and dealing with a lot of the Linux OS issues. Uh, I've been involved with the Zabbix community for quite a while. Uh, I've also written the, uh, the Ruby interface library for the API, uh, ZBX API. Um, and you can find me in IRC and in the forums under the username uh, NelsonAB. However, if you're in the United States and you see this license plate, yes, that is me. <coughs> so, um, I, I like to think I have the coolest plate in the United States. So, let's get into it, shall we? So, performance tuning, uh, you know, as you start to think about a lot of this, does kind of follow the scientific method in some respects. So what is a scientific method? Well, first off, we usually start with some kind of a problem. Well, first, we have to kind of define what our problem is. And then we're going to you know, sit there and maybe we have an idea of how to solve the problem or, or whatever. So we'll state a hypothesis. Uh, then we'll prepare some tests to test whether our hypothesis is correct to understand you know, what our, our um, you know, problem was. And we'll analyze our results and see if we were right and then you know, generate a conclusion based on that. So as we go straight into it here, um, and we look at performance tuning, we realize it does involve a, a multitude of components. How many times have you tried to do a performance tuning on an application um, that spanned network, storage system, plus physical hardware, oh, and it's running on a virtual machine? So, I mean, that's a multitude of components, and it's very, very common in today's environment that you're going to span multiple pieces. Well, each one of those pieces has its own performance tuning, so, you know, you sometimes have to take a holistic and a macro or a micro focus at the same time. Um, and dovetail that, you know, identifying your problem can, can be very, very challenging. Um, and so, and, but at the same time, if you don't define your problem very clearly, well, what's the point in tuning? And we'll talk about that in a little bit and some of the, the reasons why you want to uh, have a well-defined problem. Uh, and we'll talk about some of the, the challenges that, that uh, you know, have seen before on that one. So, uh, so why do we want to tune? Well, one of the, you know, the major things is, well, we want better performance out of you know, the hardware that we have or you know, the software that we're using. We want to maximize it. You know, we keep talking about a lot of that. Um, and at the same time, as I was kind of talking earlier, you don't want to let your problem define you. Uh, you want to define what the problem is. If the problem is defining you, know, you then you are basically being got, you know, dragged around by, you know, um, you'll get into it, you know, no, that didn't work, no, try something else, no, that didn't work, try something else, no, that didn't work. And you end up running around in circles, and that's not effective. So you want to define what your problem is, not, you know, as I say, be defined by your problem. Um, you know, it's just like I say here, you know, you want to figure out how to get somewhere, well, you need to have a destination. So if you don't know where your destination is, how are you ever going to get there? So what are some examples, like I talked about, with defining your problem? You know, it's too slow, it doesn't work. You know, those are very, very bad descriptions. They're not actionable. A good description is something you, that is an actionable statement. Um, you know, some good actionable statements. You know, I need to have my, you know, MySQL database perform you know, uh, a uh, reconciliation query in under half a second at the end of the day during this time period. That is a fantastic statement, and you can very easily um, 
test against that statement because this is the statement you're going to essentially use to guide all of your testing. So you want to have that as something as a define an actionable statement. You know, action words are very important to use here. So what are some examples of, you know, once we get into this and we start testing it? Well, many times you'll see people will set up a test scenario and they'll, they'll run a little, you know, bash script or something like that or some little copy command, you know, to maybe test network performance over NFS. While they're useful for ad hoc stuff, they're not very useful for overall. Because if I'm going to sit here and you know, run time against copy, well, I don't really have that data easily correlated. I can't necessarily repeat this test easily. You want your tests to be easy to repeat. You want your tests to be consistent. So that's why you want to script them as best you can. And the nice thing about scripting them is now you can also modify it so the output is consistent because you want to consistently store you know, all of this data that you get so that as your process evolves, you understand maybe where the changes are starting to happen. So what is a good test? Well, it is representative of the problem. Well, many times it's hard to actually figure this out. Um, you may have, uh, you know, like let's, let's go with a financial scenario. You have a reconciliation query that you need to run against, uh, you know, for a financial institution at the end of the day. Well, that query may actually take, in general, um, you know, the full job may take two hours. Well, two hours to you know, figure this out is not a very good test to be able to do. You want to you know, break it down to something a little smaller, something that you, know, you can test pretty quickly, maybe in 10 minutes or something like that. So you can then tune something and tweak it and then try it again and see what it does. So you'll take your, um, your scenario and figure out, okay, well, what is it really doing? You know, where is it really hitting? All right, so let's then design a test that kind of emulates a lot of these pieces. Um, <clears throat> and as I mentioned earlier with scripting, well, you want your output to be you know, consistent. You want your test to be repeatable. So you want to you know, um, think about those kinds of aspects. So Politics and external forces also play a role. I mean, you've got, you know, as I described here, you know, you've got an application that's owned by a department who is, you know, using another, you know, division within the company, and they're the ones that are the systems administrators responsible for administering the machine, but the performance problems that users are talking about, well, they're actually from a, um, due to another department who maybe runs the network. Um, or, you know, the storage, or, you know, it's, it's because they're on VMs and, you know, the VM cert hypervisor is overloaded with other guests. So, you know, many times your pain points may not be where you expect them to be. So, you know, be aware of those things. Um, as I keep coming back to, um, make sure you have, a, you know, uh, agreed upon set of tests. Make sure all the stakeholders agree that your tests are uh, representative of the problem. So, and then, uh, you know, as we go through and you start testing all these pieces, you know, you're going to want to, you know, look at, you know, uh, pieces. Hey, are we, we uh, you know, getting close to it? And, um, you know, is our results kind of, you know, approximating what we're expecting? Is it diverging from what we're expecting? And if it's diverging, it's okay. Look at why it's diverging. Maybe look at your test. Maybe they weren't representative. Maybe they weren't appropriate. And that's fine. Change your tests and then restart the process. Um, but at the same time, as I also talked about with the output of data, make sure you log all this data. One of the best things you can be doing here is make sure your data gets logged to a central location that everyone has at least read access to. Let all the stakeholders use the same data as they're going to do their analysis. Someone may want to you know, take that data set, throw it into a, a spreadsheet, and do some statistical analysis on it, uh, and that's fine. But Use the data that everyone else is using. Don't go onto the machine, run your own little test, and then say, oh, well, here I've got this test. Well, that external test may not be representative of the problem. Uh, it may only show a little piece. But you know, if it's going to be useful overall, we'll include that as part of your suite of tests. So um, it's kind of the, the things to go. So document. Document is a, uh, a, a very important process. You know. Um, as I mentioned earlier, if, you're, if your tests were not appropriate and you know, you're starting to find some divergence and stuff like that, well, you know, document you know, why maybe you're having some of that divergence. It doesn't have to be a huge manuscript of a, of a document. 
uh, all you really need is maybe a, a small you know, uh, text document that you know, has a date stamp in it and a little note about, hey, this test wasn't appropriate, so we went with this other test. Because I can guarantee you, in one week or two weeks or three months later, you're going to sit there and go, well, why did we change to this other test? And if you have a little tiny note, you can at least have a better chance of recalling why things changed. So, you know, as I say here, hey, if, if, uh, if a test was on, on, run on a server and nobody logged it, did the test really happen? Well, three months from now, of course it never happened because we don't see the data, we don't have it logged. So, if I haven't said this enough, document. Document, document, document. We all hate it, but it's the most important thing you can do in these types of scenarios. Usually because you'll come back to these documents in months from now. So, talked about, or alluded to this one earlier, and uh, there's a very unique scenario that I, I was involved with uh, at one point. So they had a, a middleware application running on Solaris x86. Uh, they were migrating to RHEL, and uh, they were noting that their middleware application was running slower on RHEL. The hardware for RHEL was newer than the Solaris x86. You know, uh, as you look at this, you're thinking, well, it should be faster. I'm on a newer operating system, I'm on newer hardware, things should be faster. So we dove into it a little bit deeper. We found that C, you know, or that, um, uh, C states were enabled on the processor you know, to enable power efficiencies. So we turn off C states. We find some performance improvement. We found that hyper-threading was not you know, enabled on the Solaris side. So we disable hyper-threading on the, uh, the Linux side. That gave us a little bit more improvement because now we had full cores of the processor available to, for each of the jobs. And we dug deeper and deeper, and we finally got ourselves to within 15%. Well, then we look at the, the clock CPU speed between the two physical machines, and the physical CPUs were slower on newer hardware by about 10%. So now this difference actually starts to come down to a correlation very similar to hardware. The client, of course, didn't like this, um, but at this point in time, we were kind of you know, up against the wall. We've already done kernel tuning. We've done hardware tuning. We had the hardware vendor there, and the hardware vendor was giving us best practices on hardware tuning. We had basically hit the wall. On top of that, this, you know, the tests that we were doing weren't necessarily representative. They were changing. They were ad hoc. People were you know, using their own data sets to do analysis on, and no one was putting it into a central location. No one was really logging when these tests were run and everything else. So then later on, you got into conference calls of people you know, kind of starting to go, well, we did this. didn't work. And then you know, other people are disagreeing in conference calls, and it was very difficult to uh, kind of manage a lot of these pieces as we went forward. Um, you know, but if we'd maybe you know, taken the time to you know, do these you know, logging steps and documenting steps, uh, we you know, quite possibly could have uh, headed off a lot of those pain points uh, later on down the road. So, Little's Law. Let's talk about that for a second. So many of you guys have probably seen Little's Law. You know, L equals H times delta, or times lambda. So, you know, the Q length uh, is uh, equal to the um, time to service uh, you know, times the arrival rate. So, Little's Law was actually invented, uh, was uh, formulated, uh, I believe, in the early 20th century, in the 1900s. And it was essentially for banking. Uh, he basically said, he observed in a bank uh, that the length of the queue at the tellers was related to, um, you know, how long it took people, you know, the, the time to service uh, each request, times you know, uh, how you know, quickly people were arriving into the bank. So it turns out this is actually very useful in performance tuning in general. And a lot of performance tuning kind of starts to follow Little's Law. It's not going to be precise. You can't necessarily go, you know, uh, plug in this network data here, this piece here, and I'm going to get a formula out of it. So, but it can help you to approximate and understand the factors involved in your performance tuning. So, you know, uh, maximum transmission unit, as I say, that can be, you know, analogous to, you know, your arrival rate. Um, because if you can increase your maximum transmission unit on a network, that means you can send more packets over the network. Your arrival rate is speeding up. Some of these pieces you'll be able to touch, you know, to change. Some of them you can't change as you're doing your performance tuning. So bandwidth delay product, BDP, we, you know, anyone who's done much networking 
and performance tuning on networking has looked at this one. But a lot of the descriptions are kind of tricky. You know, they talk about, ah, you know, here's your BDP, here's the formulation to do, and then here's how to set your TCP window sizes. But what does it really mean? Well, t bandwidth delay product is essentially how many bytes of data are on the wire at one point in time. And so you use that formulation to then figure out, hey, if we have a one gigabit link with a 2.2 millisecond round trip time, well, that means we're going to have 0.27 megabytes of data physically on the wire at any time. So if I want to buffer that full data connection, I need to have 2.7 megabytes of buffer to receive it. So, because, you know, if you can't receive the data, well, then the data never got to the host, and now you start to get timeouts and network performance degradation and stuff like that. So this is where that's useful, but it's kind of hard to understand, well, why do I need this buffer? We need the buffer to receive the data on the wire so that then you can send a message back, hey, my buffer is full, stop sending me some data. Uh, and it turns out TCP is actually really, really good at a lot of those back offs and tunings. So let's look at, you know, how MTU, as I was talking about, kind of changes our, our, our data points. So if we set our MTU size to 9,000, which is essentially jumbo frames on, on a lot of the network, we find that we can get almost one gigabit of data, um, you know, nine, you know, 939 megabits. That's pretty good. Uh, you know, on a point-to-point -point communication. But if we use the standard MTU size of 1,500, wow, we're kind of off by 50 megabits. That's a pretty substantial difference that we can start to see. And then, you know, just for grins, I decided to set it to something extremely low. And as you can see, our, uh, you know, packet rates, you know, it jumped tremendously, and our data rate drops, uh, drops tremendously as well to the point where we have extremely poor network performance. So... You know, just because you can send a lot of, you know, your arrival rate is very high doesn't necessarily mean that's a good thing because each packet has overhead to it. Um, and I think I calculated it out, and it's essentially each TCP packet on the, on the network wire has uh, like 42 or 50 bytes uh, of overhead necessary. So that's why you start to see that difference between 9,000 MTU and a 1,500 MTU is because you have less overhead per data that you send across the wire, making the wire much more efficient. So how could we use Little's Law in, in our monitoring? So you know, we, we can look at things like um, you know, IO data stats, you know, how many uh, requests are in flight. You can get this one pretty easily out of the kernel. Uh, another, a trickier one to get out of the kernel might be TCP or, or network buffer uh, queue depth, where you're looking at you know, how many packets uh, or how much data is sitting in your uh, receive queue for a uh, socket connection on how much data is sitting in your transmit side of your network adapter. You can get those out of um, the, the Linux kernel. They're a little trickier to get. Um, a lot of the I.O. request data is available in sys and proc. So that's a pretty straightforward one to get. You can get your network buffers out of proc, but it's better to use some of the utilities um, to help you know, kind of extract that data. Um, you know, Zabbix will get you packets per second pretty easily, you know, uh, so that's a good one. Process load um, and, uh, you know, all the, the various um, processor-related uh, items that Zabbix can give you. You know, and of course, um, you know, as we've been talking about with MySQL and, and stuff like that, you know, time to service a request. You know, how long does it take to service a, a query? How long does it take to service a web page? So time to service is another, you know, useful one to get. Sometimes time to service is a challenging one to do. So as we start to put this in action, kind of show what we were talking about, I decided to take Apache. Um, let's talk about, you know, let's look at what we can do with Apache in terms of performance monitoring. So, you know, as we know, it's a foundation for a lot of stuff. Um, normally, we would parse the, you know, the access log or the error log file um, manually or an offline basis. Well, as this file is growing quickly on a system that's got a lot of connections, well, how do you know where the last point you read the log file you know, the last time Zabbix queried the log file to read versus where the log file has grown to, well, that could be multiple megabytes of data on a very, very loaded machine. So that's hard to do. How do we correlate it? Well, I've seen some people will then say, okay, fine, and then I'm going to pump that to Splunk, and I'm going to let Splunk you know, go with that data, and then Splunk's going to pipe it into Zabbix. A very viable choice, but you now have latency because it takes how long Splunk to process that data and then Splunk to push it into Zabbix you could have five to 10 minutes lag depending on how you have things configured. So, um, like I say, a lot of these things don't necessarily work well with Zabbix to get them in there. But, turns out Apache has the ability to log to a script or log to a pipe. 
Uh, and so that's kind of what we did, or what I did here. Was I, so I broke the, this, this problem into two pieces. First, I created a script that basically listened for Apache data coming in, or data coming into it from Apache. Uh, it would take that data uh, and parse it. But I also made sure that I sent the data in a format that I controlled. So, you know, my date, um, you know, time to service the request, uh, the byte sent, uh, and, and so forth, so I can then take that data. My script also sets up a socket um, in you know, the varlib Zabbix directory. Um, since I'm running this on Fedora and Red Hat, um, you know, everything is gonna be centered around the Fedora package uh, for, for, for Zabbix. So then you know, it, this script creates a file socket that you can then read just like you would in the proc file system, and it gives you data that's very easy to now import into Zabbix. How many times have, many, have you guys in here written a user parameter or a user script for Zabbix? Many times. That's one of the most powerful features of Zabbix is that ability to write a script to pull data in from external sources and not care where it came from. Because once it's in Zabbix, it's a number or it's a, it's a string, and who cares where it came from? Now we can compare it within the engine. So that's what we did there, or I did there, um, you know, to get that data. Well, then I wrote a script that would parse this data uh, via a cron job. So every minute I'm parsing the script and I'm using you know, Zabbix Sender to send it to the Zabbix server as a trapper. Now, I didn't have to do that. I could have set this up as a passive item or an active item and, and worked with that. But what I wanted to do because of um, the nature of the data, I wanted to have correlated data that was consistent in timestamps. So that you know, if I'm looking at uh, packets per or, you know, count of URLs, I want that to be correlated with um, average request times. So, and that's why I used um, cron to basically take a lot of that data and then send it to Zabbix in a, uh, a time coherent manner. Um, but I could have very easily have done this as an active or a passive check uh, inside of a, uh, a user parameter script, very, very easily. And then I created a template to uh, you know, look at the various aspects of it. You know, total bytes received by Apache. Well, that's, that's actually data from the log file. You know, how many bytes did Apache send? Once again, that came from the Apache logs. So I can start to now look at this data and you know, correlate it over time and start to, to look at that information. So, so let's put all this into action. Let's see what we can do. So here's the test environment that I had. So all hosts are running on RHEL 6 um, or, or, or Red Hat derivatives. These are Rev, um, uh, Red Hat virtualization machines. Uh, one of them is running my test client, or load client as I called it, and the other one is running load server. Load server is running Apache. Uh, Apache is, you know, like I say, the tool I was using. It's also got the log analysis you know, tools that I, I was talking about earlier installed. It's worth noting that the, um, the VMs sitting inside there are backed up by the storage server. The storage server and everything talks to the, the host over InfiniBand. So the network is not necessarily a problem here in terms of latency for the iSCSI backend for each of the guest systems. Um, some of my tests were run from a, an, a physical machine, but that physical machine had a firewall in the middle of it that would only do packet inspection at 100 megabit. Um, these machines were connected to each other uh, via a gigabit switch that had LACP running, and so it was a dual, uh, dual you know, bonded NIC. So essentially you had uh, total aggregative uh, two gigabit connections between the hypervisors. Um, so, I mean, it's a, it's, it's, it's a system that's designed to allow me to find the, the maximum edges. So, what are we looking for here? Um, as I kind of mentioned before, it's normal to um, evolve your tests as you go through. You know, it's normal to say, I'm testing it out, I'm not liking my data, maybe my tests aren't good enough. And so we may have to come back and, and change some things. So that's kind of normal. Um, at some point, we're gonna look for some saturation here. So saturation is gonna take uh, a number um, of forms. Most often, you're gonna look at you know, increased time to service. You know, in a MySQL environment, you know, many of us have looked at it in the older versions of Zabbix in terms of Zabbix tuning. Uh, you look at MSQ, uh, MySQL slow queries. And that's a, a very good example of increased time to service. As you increase your queries, time to service increases, your Zabbix server now slows down, you know, you've got uh, you know, kind of a, a circular problem here. 
Next one you may experience is a failure to service. Failure to service may be that the process you're connecting to is too full, can't get the data, and so it just basically sends back an error and refuses the connection. So we're going to maybe see some of these kinds of, uh, of, of activities. So here's the first set of tests. So I'm running these from my desktop machine that I mentioned earlier. It's coming across the firewall. And this is the URL count per second that Apache is responding back to me. Now it's worth noting that the simple hello world page that I had um, is essentially um, just a you know, couple of bytes of text, a simple HTML page plus one embedded image. And I was running JMeter on the, t the, the, client, the test machines against Apache. So I used JMeter to kind of generate my load uh, in, in all of this. And so Apache is saying, I'm getting a maximum of 800 connections per section, or 800 URL pages per, uh, you know, sent over the wire per second. Processor load, yeah, nothing. Network, so we do show that, hey, we have a plateau. We do show that, hey, you know, our network is kind of getting saturated at some point. But when we look at our CPU utilization, and our CPU utilization is showing almost zero system time or zero user time uh, overall. This is a, tool, a dual core guest machine on the, on the virtualization. The hypervisors are not running any other guests. So these hypervisors are not loaded. It's, you know, it's a dual core guest. So there's no external forces involved in this tuning. So that doesn't quite look right. Here we start to see something very, very interesting. And this was something unexpected to me. As we go through, we notice that, hey, before our test, Apache is taking, what is this, uh, about 100 milliseconds to respond to you know, a request to service. But as we load it down, um, we start to note that performance improves, that Apache is saying it's taking less time for Apache to send that packet or you know, that web page or that URL back to the client. That's a very interesting one, um, and it was very unexpected. And as I you know, looked in deeper and everything else, the most likely culprits there is caching. So as we increase the load on the Apache, well now L2 and L3 cache in the processor become more likely because as our you know, connections in increase in rate, that means that data for that's involved with that component of Apache or that part of the web page is more likely to stay in processor cache or it's more likely to stay in local you know, uh, uh, disk caches and stuff. But what was also interesting um, is the, we ha I had a test set up too where uh, Zabbix would actually try and load the same page. Zabbix was actually starting to show that it was taking much, much longer to service this web page. But yet as we see, Apache is telling me no, I am serving these pages faster than ever. But Zabbix is telling me, no, we're getting these pages loading slower than ever. This didn't make sense. So this is what JMeter actually you know, presented to me. Um, so as we, we step this up, with each step, we increase the rate of, uh, uh, of requests that we generate to Apache per second. Um, and we can see here that we're peaking out at around 320 packets per, or you know, URL connections per second. Now this is looking at full page loads. And remember, a page load is two components, the text portion and the graphic image that's embedded. So whereas Apache earlier was showing close to 800. So there is a little bit of discrepancy between these two, um, but they do begin to correlate when you look a little closer to the data sets. You know, as we can see, you know, so we're, we're able to do transactions per second, pretty high, you know, decent rate. We also see that overall latency has not tremendously increased. I mean, so something, something's a little interesting here. So, as I mentioned earlier, the, you know, the, the uh, processor cache and other caches may be, you know, uh, responsible for uh, the reduced response time that we, we noted. Um, it also starts to appear that there could be an external bottleneck. As I looked a little deeper, showed the network was, uh, was the bottleneck. As I looked at the, uh, the CPU on my firewall, I found that that CPU was almost pegged out. So this uh, you know, Juniper uh, SG20 firewall was basically maxed out in its performance. And you know, it was just going you know, all out. And I also started to note, too, in other tests that uh, Zabbix was dropping data from other hosts that were behind that same firewall. 
So now the firewall was my culprit here in terms of my maximum performance. So, but I still wasn't happy. So I needed more testing. So, you know, it's like I go along and I say, um, you know, I decided to change things. So this one, I built, I set up another uh, VM on the opposite hypervisor. So now I'm not going, you know, through my firewall. I've got uh, very fat network pipes between the two hosts. I don't have any external uh, limitations. And so let's see what we get. Wow, almost 3,000 URLs per second. That's pretty good, especially when we came from 800 before. You know, we start to see you know, CPU load. CPU load is starting to you know, jump. Now, these were done on, Apache, or on, on Zabbix 2.2, and in Zabbix 2.2, as we know, um, CPU load is actually done on an on aggregated per processor basis. So um, a CPU load of one means that if I have a four core machine, my CPU load is actually going to show t uh, four inside of top, but inside of Zabbix it's going to show one. Um, so it's kind of a, a nice one, you know, coming from the older days of Zabbix, you know, it took me uh, just something to remember, but it makes things a little bit simpler and also allows you to get a, a closer apples to apples comparison across machines. So network. So if you, um, the network previously was, uh, you know, kind of peaked out, it was a smooth graph. Well, now we're starting to get a sawtooth and that sawtooth in there is kind of interesting. We'll dive into that one a little bit more as we can also see our CPU utilization is, is also starting to, to uh, increase as well. So we're starting to see some data that you know, could possibly say that we're finding our maximum performance. So if remember last time I talked about um, latency, Apache was reporting latency. Well, it dropped even lower. As I increased load, Apache responded even faster, or at least that's what it reported. Now, Zabbix, on the other hand, on its web test, as we can see, it's you know, responding back very quickly, but it's also not really showing much deviation in the latency it's seeing. So you know, essentially, it's able to you know, insert its request in the middle of all this you know, very fast testing and get responses back very quickly or not. Here's what JMeter showed us. So as we can see, things start to fall apart. Remember I talked about earlier, we're going to be looking for data that starts to fall apart. We're going to be looking for data that exhibits a um, um, possibly a not a, you know, unable to service a request, a timeout, or something like that. Right at around 1,200 um, connection or you know, 1,200 pages per second is about when we start to see things fall apart. Now the part that I didn't quite fully you know, understand due, due to time is, well, why is JMeter starting to show that we're still you know, increasing in the number of pages per second that we're loading? So it may just be an aberration in terms of how JMeter records the data. You know, so a little bit more analysis is, is important. But that's also you know, important as part of your performance tuning process. You know, uh, look at your data and you, you know, do your analysis to understand your data. Um, it turns out as we look at our logging and everything, right around this point in time is when we begin to see our first error messages from Apache and from JMeter in terms of when it was unable to service a request. So that was, you know, the, the important thing. And as we increased load, it only grew from there. So, like I said, CPU uh, latency appears to be dropping. Network was not our bottleneck this time. Um, and, you know, JMeter, as I was mentioning, you're starting to see the, the, the data fall apart, um, meaning that we've probably found peak performance. Uh, and, you know, peak performance on this scenario with this web page, with these hardware, is probably about 1,200 pages per second. Um, but what if I can't um, set up such a simple test like this? What if I have, a, you know, as I was talking earlier about a larger application, um, what do I do? Or what if I cannot find my maximum performance? What can I do to simulate um, activities that would allow me to find maximum performance? Turns out we've got a, lot of, you know, a couple of tools that are very useful here. The first place that I would start to look is um, if you're in a, a guest a VM environment, take a core or two away, take some CPU away, take some memory away. You can very easily do that on a, on a VM. Um, so you can tune those things and take resources away and then see what happens. Well, if you start to see bottlenecks, well, you're going to start to see bottlenecks because you took some resources away that you had before, and maybe you'll start to see where your maximum performance is. Well, now you can start to look at, well, if I took, you know, 50% of my CPU away and I suddenly hit maximum load and I could never hit it on, you know, with the other CPU, well, maybe my maximum load is actually double what I thought it was. 
you know, uh, and so forth. It's not ex going to be a precise science there, but it can at least give you some, some estimations. Uh, another way, let's say you're on a physical machine, well, you can't necessarily slow down the clock speed on your physical machine. You can't necessarily t you know, take out memory, but you have capability of C groups. You can start to use C groups to limit CPU, you know, CPU availability to a process. You can also use C groups to limit the amount of memory a process has and start to use those kinds of tools to restrict what that process or that host can do to restrict a, you know, a, a less powerful machine to allow you to estimate potentially um, you know, what you can be doing. So, in conclusion, you know, understand your problem. So that's one of the hardest things to do. Remember in the example I talked about, the, the problem was never clearly defined. No one really sat down and gave an actionable statement about what our problem was. It was just, it's too slow. Well, what is too slow? Well, we can't really tell you what too slow is until we test it. That's not a very good you know, statement to test against. That's very difficult to do performance tuning against. Um, you know, understand your tests. You know, your tests are going to evolve. That's fine. That's good. But if they're going to evolve, understand why they're evolving and, you know, and, and go forward. Document. You cannot document enough. Um, and then also, as I was saying too, in long-term monitoring, many of the things you might do for performance analysis you can also integrate into your long-term uh, uh, monitoring. You could, for instance, in this scenario, say, if my Apache server is starting to show a load greater than you know, 1,000 pages per second, well, maybe I should consider spinning up a second VM. So maybe I should do a trigger that tells me my Apache server is getting loaded, which can then give me a warning, which uh, you know, has a trigger, which connects to an action, which may tie into Foreman, which tells Foreman to spin up a VM, spins the VM, and then goes into you know, some configuration management tool and tells our Citrix VIP, you know, um, uh, load balancer to then add this other machine to the VIP, and now all of a sudden we've dynamically improved performance by using Zabbix. That would be one scenario you can do, and it's a very easy, um, or not necessarily easy, but it's a very uh, plausible and, and you know, uh, workable solution here. So, if you guys want the source code for the, uh, the tools, the scripts that I wrote, uh, and the template, you can find it here. Thank <laughs> you.